I love this thing. It's so cool. I'm gonna have to get, oh, hey. Hi, I am Matthew Burchette, and this is Curator on the Loose. And as you can probably tell, we are gonna talk about the FG1D Corsair today. Vought's F4U Corsair is considered the premier Navy and Marine Corps fighter of World War II. The prototype XF4U-1 made its first flight on May 29, 1940, and in October became the first single-engine U.S. fighter to fly faster than 400 miles per hour. Vought received a production contract in late June 1941, and planes began rolling off the assembly lines by mid-1942. Although designed as a carrier-based fighter, the Corsair entered combat not with the U.S. Navy, but with the U.S. Marine Corps flying from small South Pacific islands instead of aircraft carriers. By late 1944, it was one of the U.S. Navy's most capable carrier-based fighters and racked up an impressive 11 to 1 kill ratio with the likes of Pappy Boeington, Ken Walsh, and Ira Kepford at the controls. After the war, the Corsair served almost exclusively as a fighter bomber during the Korean War and served in Indochina and Algeria with the French Air Force during the 1950s. Over 12,000 Corsairs were built and its 1942 to 1953 production run is the longest of any U.S. piston engine fighter. Vought was asked to develop a carrier fighter with the highest possible top speed, but a low stall speed. Now here's a bit of information that you might not know, but it's really important to us here at the museum. Vought's lead designer, Rex Beazel, graduated from Seattle's Queen Anne High School and the University of Washington. He designed the Corsair around Pratt & Whitney's R2800 double WASP radial engine that pumped out 2,250 horses and used this massive 13-foot, 4-inch Hamilton standard propeller to turn that power into speed. However, that big engine and a cockpit that sat pretty far back on the fuselage made it difficult for pilots to see over the plane's nose and led to one of its nicknames, Hose Nose. Another design hurdle was how to keep that monster prop away from the carrier deck, but still have landing gear strong enough to withstand the stress of an ensign slamming his plane down during a landing. Instead of building long, gangly landing gear to keep the prop clear of the deck, Beazel and his team came up with this bent wing idea. The bend allowed them to develop shorter, stronger gear for carrier landings, but still keep that big old prop off the deck. The unusual wing gave the Corsair its distinctive shape and reduced drag, allowing the bent wing bird to fly even faster. But a bigger issue was solved by this little guy right here. Early F4Us had problems recovering from spin since the gull wing shape interfered with proper elevator control. It was also found that the left wing could stall and drop suddenly during low speed landings. And if the throttle was quickly advanced, like during an aborted landing, the plane could flip over with the rapid increase in power. So Vought engineers figured out that a small six inch long stall strip on the leading edge of the right wing solved the problem by allowing the right wing to stall at the same time as the left. Now for the Corsairs that carried HVARs, four sets of small stubby little mounts under each wing allowed the plane to carry eight rockets. As you also may have noticed, our bird has drop tanks but it could have carried bombs like this model, and they would have gone on these stations, and you could have even carried one right under the center line of the fuselage. This is a pretty roomy cockpit, but I gotta admit, it is hard to see over that big nose. I'm six foot, 
and I'm still having a hard time seeing what's in front of me. Now, normally, a pilot would simply just S-turn right down the taxiway to be able to see what was around them, but you can't really do that on a carrier deck. Luckily, they didn't have far to go on the deck of, say, the Bunker Hill or other carriers. Now you can see what I'm talking about. It's a pretty limited view. Hey, while we're here, let's talk about some of the things around us. This is the Mark 8 reflector gun sight. It projected an illuminated reticle, sometimes called a pipper, onto this glass plate. It allowed you to aim with both eyes open. Here's the armament panel. It contained all the switches for your guns and gun camera. You all know these. These are your flight instruments. It's the artificial horizon, compass, altitude indicator, turn and bank indicator, airspeed indicator, and your rate of climb. This is your engine control unit. It houses your throttle, mixture control, prop governor, and supercharger controls. You also have your landing gear and flap controls here. And this guy is your wing fold control. Over on this side is your map case, O2 bottle and regulator, and radio controls. You had your gun trigger and buttons for the radio and bomb release right here on the stick. Pretty cool, huh? Now you know a bit more than you did about the Corsair in general. But what about this bird? What makes it so special? Well, first off, you've heard me refer to it as an FG-1D and not an F4U. What's up with that? Well, our Corsair was built by Goodyear, not Vought. Yeah, you heard that right, Goodyear, as in tires. During World War II, the need for Corsairs was so great that Goodyear Aircraft and Brewster were tapped to produce the fighter to get more of them into the air faster. Now here's where it gets really cool. The museum's Corsair was delivered to the U.S. Navy in April 1945, and she served aboard the USS Intrepid. After the war, it was transferred to the Naval Reserve and eventually stationed at Naval Air Station Sandpoint in Seattle in 1950. On July 29, 1950, Commander Ralph Millicent and Ensign Stanley Hayes were on a routine flight over Lake Washington when the two collided in midair. Luckily, both pilots survived unhurt, but their planes sank to the bottom of the lake. Now, fast forward 33 years. After sitting under 190 feet of water, Millicent's aircraft was brought to the surface in 1983 by California-based Air Marine Salvage and restored by Air Power Unlimited of Jerome, Idaho and our own restoration facility at Payne Field. But this isn't the only Corsair we have. Oh no, we also have the biggest, baddest Corsair of them all. And I think we better go check that sucker out. This is the Goodyear F2G Corsair. It's sometimes referred to as the Super Corsair, and for good reason. This thing is a beast. The F2G was developed in 1944 by the Goodyear Aircraft Company as an offshoot of Vought's F4U Corsair that we just saw. But the F2G was intended to be a low-level interceptor and was equipped with a 28-cylinder four-row Pratt and Whitney R4360 air-cooled radial engine. Known officially as the Wasp Major, the engine got a groovy nickname because of the configuration of its 28 cylinders. Each row of the seven air-cooled cylinders were just slightly offset from the ones in front of them. This formed a kind of semi-helical arrangement that provided better cooling to all the cylinders behind the front rows. Some smart guy, probably from Nebraska, thought the whole thing looked like a big old corn cob and the name stuck. You know, I have to admit, it kind of does look like a corn cob. Anyway, this big hoss churned out 3,000 horsepower. And when you have that much oomph, 
you need to make sure your prop doesn't spin too fast. Goodyear geniuses added a gearbox to keep the propeller in the butter zone, but they also added a supercharger to force air into that big engine. What Goodyear found was that, that big old corn cob added about 50% more power on takeoff. That is pretty impressive. You know, it's not really an episode of Curator on the Loose if we don't check out the cockpit, if at all possible. And here we are in the office of the Super Corsair. It looks pretty much like any other Corsair model. So what, besides that monster engine, made the Super Corsair so super? Well, honestly, not that much. Yeah, it had that huge engine, but it also broke with Corsair tradition and had a bubble top canopy. Hey, it worked for the Mustang, the Jug, the Spitfire, and the FW190, so why not the Corsair? It gives the pilot a much better all-round view. It also got a much taller vertical stabilizer with an auxiliary rudder. It would automatically turn 12.5 degrees to the right when the landing gear was extended, and that was just to counteract the torque of that monster 4360 engine. So if this thing was so awesome, why are there so few left? That's pretty simple. The F2G was canceled because it didn't live up to expectations. While it had an impressive climb rate of 4,400 feet per minute, its top speed was just 430 miles per hour. That's right on par with the Mustang Thunderbolt and F4U1D, so it wasn't that big of a step up. Couple that with some stability issues, and the Super Corsair just wasn't that super in the eyes of the US Navy. That left just the 10 production birds, which were either scrapped, they crashed, or were sold as air racers, which leads us to our next question. But for now, I am just gonna kinda hang out in here in my happy place. What about this plane? What's its story? The museum's F2G1 Corsair, BU number 88454, if you really wanna get technical, was delivered in 1945. As the first production F2G1, it spent most of its active career at the Navy Air Test Center at Pax River, Maryland. In 1948, it went into containerized storage at Norfolk, Virginia, with only 246 hours of flight time on this airframe. Sometime in the early 1960s, it was discovered by a Captain Walter Ulrich, and the Navy title then passed to the Marine Corps Museum at Quantico, Virginia. The Marines traded this and a Douglas Sky Raider to, wait for it, Doug Champlin. Now, when the Museum of Flight acquired the Champlin collection in 2003, this rare bird came home to roost in Seattle. So there you go, a tale of two Corsairs. You got the F4U1 and the F2G1. How cool is that? This has been so much fun. Thank you all for tuning in and stay tuned for more because you never know where we're going to get loose next. <laughs> I, I hope we I hope we include that whole that whole cut. <laughs>